Boldwood presents The Woman in My Home, written by Diana Wilkinson and read by Willow Nash and Catherine Rees. The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. Before you embark on a journey of revenge, dig two graves. Confucius The Plot it's 11pm, pitch black. An owl hoots, a sarcastic scream of company. The squawk makes me freeze. I think of squid games. One, two, three red lights. If I move, I'll be shot. A salvo of bullets that'll blow my brains out. It's that crazy what I'm about to do. Not to mention what I've already done. I deserve to be shot, but not without a fight. I feel delirious, hysterical. Adrenaline, fear and anticipation are a heady cocktail. I unwind the metal tape measure till it stretches to just over six feet. It should be ample. I dig the heel of my shoe in at each end of the designated plot, then repeat for the width. A generous four feet. The tape measure doesn't lock, recoils across my fingers and gashes a bloodied line across the inside of my palm. Shit. Shit, shit. The owl hoots again. Yoo-hoo! I see you. The hoot sounds like a laugh, but that's no surprise. The scene is comical. Even to me, but needs must. I didn't discuss the details of my plan, suffice though that I shared the intent. Well, it was my intent to share without voicing the details. Who does share murder stories anyway? Certainly not personal ones. I hoot back at the owl. There is plenty of choice when trying to decide on how to dispose of a body. You'd be surprised. I googled all the options, which I now run through in my head, like a final summing up as I convince the jury I've made the right decision. I pace up and down across the plot and stride over the diagonals. Perhaps dumped at sea would have been better. But there's always CCTV cameras randomly positioned along arterial roads. Even country lanes aren't safe. Random beasts roaming into headlights, causing carnage. Creating a staged abduction in the park. Any park. Which park, though? Google wasn't as helpful as I'd hoped. Then there is the close-to-home disposal. Even with my relatively strong arms, I'm not sure I could have moved a body any real distance without some help. As it is, humping it into a car would have been a nightmare. As soon as the deed was done, I managed to drag the leaden weight down the stairs. I then hoisted the still warm cadaver, with not some little effort, onto the wheeled pallet on which the wooden planks had been stacked. I'd lifted the planks off earlier, in preparation. All that's left to do is wheel the pallet a couple of feet, roll the body over until it tumbles into the grave. It's pretty goddamn smart, to be honest. I walk backwards, forwards, sideways, around and back again before I finally pick up the spade and begin to dig. Two hours in, I've hardly scraped the surface. Shit, shit, shit. The earth is summer-baked, solid, and only starts to loosen when I unravel the hose by the fence and spend a good ten minutes soaking the surface. I finally make progress, the hole becoming more of a pit, and I dare to breathe again. Three hours in, sweat drips off me like water from a leaky pipe. It coats my vision, the torch on my mobile phone flickering in and out as I try to blink back the focus. Four hours in, I set the spade down and walk once more around the plot. It's taking shape. At last I'm hopeful I can pull it off. I knock back another bottle of water, the liquid refluxing when it hits the back of my throat, and pick up the spade. Five hours. I feel like a prisoner working for the Nazis, every weakened effort getting another lash. Until it's finally done. 4.28 a.m. I move across to the pallet and the roughly packaged body. The black bin bags have rips, 
gaps, and I gag when frozen flesh appears. But I concentrate on pushing the contraption up the garden, the wheels stubborn on the uneven path slabs, inch by sweaty inch towards the open grave. With an almighty heave, I roll the body off and into the hole. As it hits the bottom, one of the bin bags rips completely apart and exposes the top half of the torso. I reel backwards. WTF! WTF! My legs are giving up the ghost. The Nazi commander is about to shoot me and shove me in to lie alongside. I somehow hold myself together and concentrate on counting out ten pieces of wood from the neatly stacked pile. That should be enough to cover up the makeshift tomb. First, I have to throw the soil back in to cover up the body, before laying the planks on top. I'll concrete over in the days to come, when I get peace and an opportunity. As I shovel back the dirt, I dare to hum. The job is nearly done. Chapter One Flow It takes me a minute or two to work out what I'm looking at. I have to sit down, peel my eyes away from the runway. The plane is already preparing for takeoff. OMG. The pictures on the phone I'm using are grainy. It's a cheap burner phone, but the pictures are getting through, one after another. I hold the phone up, peer at the images from every angle, zooming in and out. As I try to digest what I'm looking at, several videos follow. They're even worse. I watch them several times before I manage to stand up again. My legs are like jelly, and I'm coming over hot and nauseous. I move back to the long expanse of window and shield my eyes against the glare of the sun. Kira is sitting at the front of the plane. She waved out of the small porthole near the cockpit only five minutes ago, before the plane began to taxi. I like a window seat. I remember her talking out loud as she filled in the online booking form, she was quick at entering in her card details, and before I knew it, she'd clicked buy now. First on, first off. That's why I sit at the front. And being near the toilet has its advantages, she giggled and shut down her laptop. As her left hand waved through the porthole, her right hand must have been busy on the phone. Images are still pinging onto my burner, each new shot taken from a different angle. They look like edited stills of the accompanying videos. But she's now airborne, heading across the Irish Sea to England, to stay at my home, with my husband. I stare out the window. The shock at what I've seen is turning my insides to liquid. I make a dash for the ladies in the corner of the airport lounge and get there just in time. I reach a cubicle, somehow secure the bolt before I throw up. When I collapse on the toilet seat, my body is shaking so badly I can hardly hold the phone. Ten minutes pass before I manage to reload the images. The short reels of video footage were recorded five minutes apart. This time I noticed the red seconds counting down in the top left-hand corner of the recordings. Not only have I evidence of a crime, but I have concise confirmation of the time and date and how long it took to carry it out. My husband, Ryan, is clearly visible as the perpetrator. He looks so unemotional that he's hard to recognise. But after ten years of marriage, I know it's him. Although the knowledge doesn't stop me squinting, praying I've got it wrong. In the first recording, he's carrying out the crime, calmly overpowering his hysterical weakened victim. In the second, he sets about tidying up the scene. He checks all round to see if he's left any clues. I can almost feel the relief in his features when he's finished. Is he smiling? He can't be. Surely not. In the last video, he unlocks the door and with a quick backward glance, closes it firmly after him. Yes, he's got a definite curl on his lips and it's not my imagination. Holy shit. How did Kira get these videos? They were taken years ago. Why now? She hasn't sent any messages attached to the pictures and videos. So what does she want? I stagger outside towards the taxi rank, 
I can hardly breathe, and am so light-headed I'm scared I'll collapse. What the hell do you do when you discover that your husband is a cold-blooded murderer? And you had absolutely no idea. Chapter 2 Flow By the time the taxi drops me off at the guest house, I'm seriously freaking out. I need food, but I'm far too nauseous to eat and head for the beach at Bally Home instead. I need to gulp down fresh air to help me think. I'm dizzy through shock. As I climb down onto the sand, I check the time. The plane should have landed at Luton half an hour ago. I take out the cheap phone. Why the hell did I hand over my Apple iPhone so willingly to Kira? It was all part of the ruse, as she called it. I also handed over keys to both the house and my red Audi. I'm so fuzzy-brained, it's hard to remember exactly what the ruse was. One thing I do remember is that Kira agreed, once she had my iPhone, that she'd take my calls. Day or night, 24-7. I'll pop outside, I promise. Whenever you call, I'll sneak out the back if Ryan's around. Don't worry, I'll keep you posted. It'll be fun. Let's enjoy ourselves. Her voice purrs in my head, cat and cream. I stab viciously at the screen and try the number over and over, at least six times. My first two attempts get cut off after three rings, and now it's going straight to voicemail. Why won't she pick up? I leave a couple of garbled messages. I want to scream down the phone, as it's an effort to stay calm. I need to know what's going on. I'm dripping in perspiration although the wind from the sea is biting. It cuts through to my bones, and the salt sand cocktail is seriously irritating my nose. I blast out a ferocious sneeze, which sends a group of squawking seagulls catapulting. Kira will soon be at our house. Ryan's and my house. Another hour, two hours tops. Surely she'll pick up before Ryan gets back from work. I pick my way through the water rivulets crisscrossing the sodden sand. The questions are going round in circles. The pictures Kira has sent have thrown up a whole can of worms. I thought I knew Ryan, even after he cheated. I thought he was a pretty open book. Could I have been that wrong? I've spent the last three months since I walked out wondering if I'll ever be able to forgive him for cheating. He strayed only the once, after all when he had a bunk-up with Olivia, our neighbour. In her back garden, of all places. How can I be certain there weren't other times? Does the number of times really matter, though? Is a one-night stand any worse than a full-blown affair? Is a single murder pitted against multiple crimes of a serial killer any less grave? That's why I haven't rushed back. I can't decide if I can forgive him, I'm like a one-woman hung jury. Ryan would often stay late at work. I remember our first Christmas together as a married couple. It was early December, and Ryan announced his company's festive bash for clients and employees was coming up. What about wives? Husbands? Aren't we invited? I was chomping at the bit to have some fun, and I hadn't met his colleagues. You can come, but they're all pretty boring, to be honest. I'll not stay late. Put like that, I took the hint. Thinking about it now, did he check his appearance once too often before he left? And 2am wasn't coming straight home. I want to trust Ryan. Our marriage was built on compromise and trust. I was so happy in the early days and so totally in love. He was amazing when it came to my OCD. He was really calm when I wouldn't let things rest. He seemed to understand, and I loved him even more, if that was possible. I used to go back inside the house several times before we could drive away. Even on a trip to the supermarket, I'd have to double-check all the taps were turned off, all the appliances unplugged. The furthest Ryan ever got to telling me off was to suggest a therapist. As I squelch across a rancid sea drain, pinching my nostrils against the stench of rotting seaweed, 
I start to wonder if Ryan really does go into the office to catch up on work the first Saturday of every month. The thought agitates me even more as I pick up flattened stones and skim them across the shallows. I no longer know what to think. The videos of him committing murder is a whole new ball game. His one-night stand now seems almost trivial, like he'd shoplifted sweets from the corner shop. Chapter 3. Flow I clamber across the concrete groins sunk into the beach at regular intervals. They're like dead people, face downwards in the sand. I shield my eyes and look out across the ocean. Ryan told me Scotland is visible on a clear day. No chance today as the weather is in default mode, grey and damp. I battle on towards the rocky outcrop which marks the end of the desolate stretch of sandy beach. The rocks are covered in gorse, a yellow blanket of spiky thorns. We could borrow some binoculars and do a spot of bird watching, Ryan had suggested. He was so desperate for me to love the place. Valley Home was where he was born. The heavy sky, laden with moisture, makes me wish I'd escaped to the bikini-clad tropics and lain topless on a scorching beach. A thick novel in one hand and a glass of chilled pinot in the other. I chose the desolation of County Down deliberately. Bleakness is good company for a broken heart. I wasn't ready to forgive and forget. I wanted to work things out. The beach today certainly lacks bustle, that's for sure. The only sign of life is a lone dog walker, a speck in the distance. I pick my way across the seaweed booby traps and think of the book, The Road, where father and son walk the earth searching for signs of life after a catastrophe has laid waste to the planet. Inching forward, I keep checking the cheap mobile with its dearth of sparkly stars, it's matte black with tinny reception and poor resolution. It's so small it's hard to keep hold of. A burner phone. That's what you'll need, Kira confided, as if we were embarking on some seedy covert mission. Maybe it was pretty seedy, but it was all meant as a joke. Payback against my husband, albeit payback with a difference. Kira's cackling laugh sucked me into the fun idea. It'll be such a laugh, all girls together. She hugged me. Who was I to question her enthusiasm, even when the doubts came creeping in? But now I'm doubting everything. Did she have an agenda all along, other than playing the part of new best friend and trying to cheer me up? Who the heck is she? And where did she get the photos? It could be the biting wind or the salty air, but I feel tears dribble down my cheeks. I use frozen fingers to wipe them away, but can't stop the flow. It's lucky there's no one around, because I suddenly start to sob. Large, uncontrolled convulsions. I'm absolutely on my own. No idea what to do. Chapter 4 Flow. My mind goes back to the first time I met Kira. I was having a glass of wine in the sailor's arms when Kira waltzed in. She seemed good friends with Patrick, and I spent a few weeks trying to forget how her lips lingered on his cheek. She was so at ease with him, uncomfortably familiar. Patrick has the patience of a saint, tells me he's going nowhere. He's been more than a distraction since I arrived in Northern Ireland. He's handsome, fun and single. Problem is, I'm still married and reluctant to jump too quickly into a new relationship. But he's hard to resist with his wicked twinkle and charisma. St. Patrick, that's me, he jests. But he's struggling. It's his puppy dog eyes. I can't sleep with him not until I've seen Ryan again, even if it is to end it all. But Patrick is so hot that it's really tough. Hi, mind if I join you? Kira asked that first night she appeared. I was sitting by the open fire, playing Wordle, Waffle Wordle, Anti-Wordle, Octordle, 
Ryan puts the addictive game playing down to my OCD. I play so many bloody games, one after another. At least I deleted Candy Crush when I saw sweets in my sleep. It helps me relax, I told him, but Ryan didn't get it and never joined in. My husband doesn't like competition, especially if there's the slightest chance of defeat. Yes, the seat's free, I said to Kira, reluctantly tearing my eyes from the screen. Wordle, she asked, looking over my shoulder. Her closeness made me stiffen. I nodded, not keen on random conversation. I'm Kira, she said, stretching her long legs out in front of the flames. Even when the logs spat, she held her ground. She was so relaxed, even back then. I remember wanting to get up, tell Patrick I'd see him later, when he suddenly appeared and asked Kira and I what we'd like to drink. My treat, ladies, he said. His eyes twinkled. He knew Kira well. That much was obvious. I put it down to being a small pub in a small town and the sailor's arms being her local. I winced when Patrick laid a hand on her shoulder and asked if she'd like her usual. Then he looked from one of us to the other and back again. I'd forgotten all this until now. It suddenly seems important, yet I've no idea why. You two look so alike. Check in the mirror, he said, pointing at the glass over the hearth. Geez, Patrick, give us a break, Kira said. She looked away from Patrick and turned her attention my way. What's your name again? She wasn't going anywhere. Flo, Flo Bartlam. Go on, you two. Have a look in the mirror, Patrick repeated. Don't you see it? We stood up. Kira placed a friendly arm around my shoulder and we stared into the glass. I did see the resemblance, but nothing out of the ordinary. We both have long hair, shoulder length, straight. She's a couple of inches taller and her skin is paler, almost translucent. Strange, I'm the one with the freckles. The Irish are usually the ones with freckles, she said. Are you from Ireland, originally? Scotland? The question seemed rather random, but they're coming back. She asked if I'd been to Bangor before. She then asked why I was in Ballyhome. Bloody godforsaken hole. A strange place to come for a holiday. How have you ended up here? The first time I met Kira, I wasn't in the mood to share. Things were still raw, and the familiarity between her and Patrick didn't rest easy. It's a long story, I said. Another time. I'll keep you to that, she said. And she did. Kira is good at getting what she wants. Before I knew it, I was seeing more of her than I was of Patrick. She was so at ease, familiar, like a long-lost friend. And in no time at all, she knew my life history. It felt good to talk. It hits me that, maybe, she already knew who I was. Chapter 5 Kira I skid into the pits. Flo's Audi is a mean machine. The sort of car I've always wanted. I test the brakes, let the car swivel on the gravel. I park it at an angle with the windows cracked. Left side half an inch, right side a couple of inches. Let's get the party started. The car is the first thing Ryan will see when he gets home. He's in for a shock is all I can say. Flo suffers from OCD and never parks her car at an angle. She's a talker and shared lots of secrets. She pops out around bedtime to make sure she's remembered to lock the car. How weird is that? Another thing she has a phobia about is opened windows. She keeps all the windows in her house closed, even in the summer. When I get inside, it'll be the first thing I'll do, fling them wide. I'm scared of burglars, animals getting in. Ryan thinks I'm mad, Flo confided. Typical men. They're far too trusting. I agreed with her, of course. What else was I going to do? 
Flo is certainly too trusting, that's for sure. Mother would use the word green for girls who were gullible. Before I get out of the car, I take in what is to be my new home. Tall trees. The trees must be round the back of the house because the front is void of trees. And there's a clinical lack of greenery. The square-fronted house is really symmetrical. It was Flo's choice, apparently. It looks like a child's drawing of a happy family home. Four windows, a door bang centre, with a spiky sun top right and tufted green lawn bottom left. Two circular Georgian pillars, one either side of the door, lend it a faux grandeur. OK, the sun's hiding for now, but it's all pretty perfect, albeit in an artificial way. Wait till you get round the back, though. It's so secluded that I can even sunbathe topless. Flo whooped when she shared all, her eyes glazing over in the telling. I don't need to pack a bikini then, I said, trying to nudge away her tears. Ryan and I planned to put decking round the back, a place to entertain friends in the summer. The tears rolled down her cheeks. Maybe you'll still put it in. Give it time. I flung my arms round her, gave her a huge bear hug, which seemed to stem the flow. I dig out the front door key and lift out my suitcase from the boot. It weighs a ton. Flo did comment that I'd packed a lot for only a few days. I almost forget to take out the shopping bags. They're in the passenger footwell. I made a long to-buy list on the plane, and think I've got it all. Even the meat, which was pre-ordered three days ago. I look around the street, but it's deserted. No sign of the nosy neighbours. I made another list of who lives where. Their names, ages, number of children. I even know which house is Olivia's. She's the woman Ryan slept with. Flo told me so much about the neighbours. I feel I know them personally. Living at the top of Hillside Gardens is great. We can look down at what's going on, but it's nice and quiet at the top. When Flo shared... I thought of kings and castles. But she's right. The house is perched above the others and has a great vibe about it. I head for the front door and once inside, I key in the alarm code. It's eerily quiet and the house has that unlived-in feel as if it's up for sale. There's no sign of mess. I dump my bag in the hall and take myself on a guided tour of downstairs. The lounge, the cloakroom and the kitchen. Wow. The kitchen is huge. The rest of the downstairs could fit inside the extended space. We live in the kitchen. We eat, drink, talk, entertain in the kitchen. It's open plan and it's where the action is, Flo announced. She and Ryan had knocked down the walls and extended outwards when they moved in. We built our own Aladdin's cave, she said. She was a bit smug, but I can see why. It's amazing. I get why they live in the kitchen. A large outside patio is accessed through huge glass doors that extend all the way along the backside of the house. There's so much space, you could entertain the whole street. It's nearly midday. Ryan usually gets back around six but he'll likely get back early because Flo texted a couple of days ago to say she was coming home. She used her iPhone before she handed it over to me. Once I've unpacked, I need to prepare supper. Cut up the rabbit, chop the vegetables and get the stew bubbling. If I'm to be Ryan's stand-in wife, I need to get a move on. Chapter 6 Kira. It's exactly 5.20 and I can see Ryan through the kitchen window from where I'm standing off to one side. He's gawping at the open window. He'll be wondering why it's open and how Flo managed to get it open. It was bloody tough, but I had to let the steam out, otherwise the smoke alarm would have gone off. Apparently, a few months back, the window frames had been repainted and thrown wide to expel the toxins. The Barrett's cat had crawled along the ledge, 
sneaked in, and lashed its tongue across cold chicken. Flo had slammed the window shut, and in so doing, the wet paint stuck like superglue. Ha, Ryan won't be able to open them anymore. She laughed. Flo doesn't do animals. It's part of her OCD. Well, that's her excuse. Something to do with the hairs and fear of deadly diseases carried in their feces. Ryan would love a big dog to lollop through the park with on a crisp, bright winter's morning. I'm with him on that, as I love dogs. I found a very sharp-bladed Stanley knife in a drawer by the sink and used it to slit the seal, cutting a finger in the process. I had a good route around the house, upstairs and down, and found plasters in the main bathroom cupboard. There's everything in there. The contents of the medicine chest are meticulously labelled and alphabetically arranged. In fact, every room is spotlessly kept, not a thing out of place. Ryan hasn't moved. He's standing so still, I imagine I hear him breathe. He's clutching a laptop case in one hand and a bunch of red roses in the other. I freeze when he takes a small step forward, but he stops again. <sighs> Jeez, get a move on. He seems to be sniffing something. A familiar smell. It could be the honeysuckle climbing up the trellis by the front door. I smelled it when I arrived. Or perhaps he can smell Flo's perfume, Midnight Burn, that I sprayed all over my body earlier. It's so strong, it's likely wafting through the window. I slide away from the window, and with my back to the kitchen door, I take up position by the aga. If Ryan looks through the window before he comes into the house, he'll see me at work. He'll be so convinced that I'm his wife that he'll be doubly shocked when I eventually face him. I'm wearing a blinding white t-shirt to showcase my suntan. Ryan will wonder why his wife is so brown. Flo uses factor 50 and she keeps her freckles religiously covered up. I've coated my arms with body oil, which I found in the bathroom under M for moisturisers. I'm really glad I work out as I'm toned and ready for action. Patrick jokes that I should apply for Love Island. Ryan has reached the front door, which, like the window, is also ajar. He'll be wondering why the heck Flo hasn't closed it. He's now in the hall. I wonder if he'll notice the gap above the hall table where there was a picture of him and Flo skiing, in flash gear and goggles. It's now under the stairs. My heart is thumping. I'm that nervous and excited. What the heck will he do when he realises it's not his wife cooking him his favourite rabbit stew? I could be the bunny boiler. Chapter 7. Kira. It's tempting to call out. Welcome him home. Make him get a move on. But I don't want to warn him that I might not be who he's expecting. He must be really nervous because he still hasn't appeared. What the heck is he doing? Flo shared he wasn't as cocky or as confident as he let on. She told me about when he went parachuting. She watched from 12,500 feet below and he wouldn't jump. She kept screaming at him to let go. He never did, but together they told all their friends that he had been scared, but had finally found the nerve to plummet to certain death and it had been the most exhilarating experience of his life. Flo must have really loved him, lying for him like that. I'm not sure I would have. Then I hear him shuffle around in the hall. He plonks something down by the stairs, probably the laptop case he was holding. I wonder if he's still gripping the red roses. A couple more seconds pass. No doubt he's checking himself in the hall mirror. And suddenly I hear a faint creak from the kitchen door. I don't turn, but carry on stirring the casserole. I use a small spoon, dip it in to taste for flavour. It's all an act, because my mouth tastes of metal. I wonder how long it will take Ryan to twig. I'm tempted to swivel round and yell, Gotcha! I wonder if he's noticed the tattoo on my left shoulder. That's a real telltale sign that I'm not his wife. Over my dead body, Flo told me. She'd never get a tattoo. 
no matter how tasteful. I think she was overly against them because Olivia had once had a black snake etched above her coccyx. Flo had enthused with her neighbour at the time. Wow, that's amazing! But then shared her derision later on with Ryan. I'm glad I've laid the table, as if for a special occasion. Scented candles, fancy wine flutes I found in the back of a cupboard, and white and gold serviettes. If Ryan's unsure of why Flo has come back, the sight will be like music to his ears. I can almost hear his heartbeat ratchet up. He'll still be expecting to see Flo, because that's what he's been anticipating for the past two days since he got the text saying she was coming home. He'll not be thinking or seeing straight. It's fun, but I'm grinding my teeth. I start to count. One, two, three. Then I turn round. Ryan, welcome home. Why isn't he moving? He looks as if he's having some sort of seizure. Christ, I hope he's not having a heart attack. He's blinking rapidly and has put his hand over his chest. He falls back against one of the dining chairs and seems to lose his balance. What the fuck? Who the hell are you? He spits his words, and his face has come over crimson. He looks really angry. He's going to need to calm down. Instead of stepping forward, I take a couple of steps back. For a second, I'm really scared. Chapter 8 Kira He grabs a chair and points the legs in my direction. I'm not sure why he's shielding himself from me. What does he think I'm going to do? Attack him with a kitchen knife? Are you offering me a seat? I smile, but my voice is definitely wobbly. I need to relax and get into the part I've been planning for weeks now. I turn back to the hobs, lift up the wooden spoon and stir. I offer the end for Ryan to taste. Here, try. It's really good. Listen, whoever the hell you are, can you get out of my kitchen, now? He plonks the chair down and has a good look around before he asks, Where's Flo? Is this some sort of game? Where the hell is she? He's right. It is some sort of game, but he'll not find out what sort for quite a while. There's a long way to go. Flo told me Ryan does so not like surprises. He makes her swear not to take him unawares. It's a major hate of his. Personally, I think it's about not being in control. A definite male trait. Apparently, on his 40th birthday, Flo promised no big surprises. No sneaking in of friends or colleagues waiting for him when he got back from work. She crossed her heart and hoped to die. But Flo is sneaky. I've learned that much. Sneaky in a nice way, she said when challenged. On the night of his birthday, she had a taxi pick them up and drive them to a fancy country hotel outside Cambridge. A romantic weekend for two, she told him. She showed him a new silky nightie she'd bought specially for the occasion. She kept the ruse going and enjoyed telling me how she really called his bluff. He'd gripped her hand tightly in the cab, kissed her over and over. By the time they reached the hotel, Ryan was relaxed, pleased to be getting out of London. Even when Flo hurried off in front of him, he still had no idea. That's what she told me. As I look at his face now, aghast, unbelieving, I get how she fooled him. A throng of revellers had popped out when Ryan and Flo entered the bar. Happy birthday, she'd yelled. <laughs> you didn't really think I'd not make a fuss. Flo is a schemer, that's for sure, and it looks as if Ryan suspects she's in on whatever is going on now. He's part of the way there. Flo is involved, but not nearly as much as she thinks. It'll take Flo a long time to work it all out. And Ryan even longer. By then, it'll be too late for the both of them.
Chapter 9 Kira I've made a lot of effort in looking good. Time to put it to good use. I'm looking good, aren't I? I ignore Ryan's distress and pout my lips for a kiss. When he ignores me, I pick up the matches to relight one of the candles. Caked wax has dripped onto the tablecloth, so I use a freshly painted fingernail to scrape at it. Ryan is staring. When he does speak again, his voice has risen several decibels. A spasm contorts his face as a tick throbs in his right cheek. He's jiggling his fingers up and down, one after the other. It's as if he's checking the blood is still circulating. Who the hell are you? What the fuck is going on? Listen, why don't you have a glass of wine? Calm down, I suggest, handing over a filled glass. Or do you want to get changed first? He usually goes straight upstairs, yells a quick, Hello, won't be long, and reappears some 15 minutes later. Tonight, there's no routine. He looks exhausted, and it's hard not to feel for him. But I've too much work to do before I'll let him relax. Suddenly, a phone rings. The ringtone throws me for a second. Air on the G-string, by back. It's Flo's phone, of course, but I still do a double take when it sounds. Ryan springs to action. He recognises it. The pink sparkly handset vibrates on the edge of the table and his hand automatically makes a grab for it. I'm too quick and beat him to it. Before he can react, I accept the call. Hang on, I mouth at Ryan as I move towards the patio doors. Won't be a moment, I whisper, covering the mouthpiece. Hi, Olivia, it's great to hear. And yes, I'm home. Ryan and I are just about to eat. I deliberately muffle the words. Olivia is a bit of a cow, so I told Flo I'd play her as well. Olivia won't suspect she's not speaking to Flo if I talk quietly enough. Maybe tomorrow, I tell her. I haven't quite decided how to play Olivia, but I'll pop across the road and meet her when I'm ready. I try to sound conspiratorial as if we're sharing a secret. It's for Ryan's benefit, of course, as he'll freak even more if he thinks I know Olivia. I can feel Ryan staring at me. His tension is boring into my back. I let Olivia talk and she certainly rambles. I suspect she's trying to win Flo round by her gushing welcome home. She's sorry for what she did, or at least desperate for Flo to think she's sorry, and to forgive her. No problem. Speak later. Yes, it's good to be home. With that, I swipe the phone off and dare to turn round. Ryan edges uncomfortably close. His eyes are screwed into slits, as if he's trying to focus on some part of my face, looking for some sort of clue. Flo has a minuscule scar jeering over her left eye. Ryan is peering at my left eye, as if he's looking for it. It's rather scary letting him stare. I know my skin is very different in texture to Flo's. Hers is rich with freckles, but mine is Irish white, almost opaque, I've been told. I don't tan my face, just keep my body a golden colour. He now looks all around the kitchen, as if he's waiting for Flo to suddenly jump out. Listen, whoever you are and whatever the game, I'm going to call the police. I'm going upstairs to change, and when I come down, you'd better tell me exactly what is going on, or else. Get it? He spits out his words. If he hurled a glass or two across the room, I wouldn't be surprised. He's beyond angry. His jaw is clenched, and sweat is pooling on his hairline. Okay, <laughs> don't be long. I try to keep my voice calm, but it's bloody hard. This guy has serious anger issues, that's for sure. Chapter 10. Flow. I'm now soaking, frozen to the core as I trudge further away from Banga. If I felt desolate when Ryan slept with Olivia, this is on a whole new scale. Not long after meeting Kira, we came up with a hashtag me too endeavour plan. Well, she came up with it and told me it would be fun. Why didn't I question it more? All girls together, she said. 
pay him back and enjoy ourselves. What do you say? It sounded pretty innocent. Kira squealed, clapped her hands together as the plan took shape. The idea was simple, to rattle my husband's cage. Payback with a difference. It would give him time to decide what the future held, as I still wasn't sure whether to give him a second chance. Although, since meeting Patrick, I've been more tempted to move on. At the beginning, Kira made it all seem like a harmless bit of fun. Misgivings only began to rumble as the days passed. I didn't want to piss Kira off or seem churlish by backing off. She took on the role of organiser as well as BFF, best friend forever. When she declared that I was her new BFF, who was I to knock her back? It felt good to be liked. Kira was non-judgmental, didn't know too much about my background, and there was no doubt I was in need of a confidence boost. Kira is very persuasive. She's got a raucous laugh and is self-deprecating to a fault. She certainly laughs at herself. If you can't take it, don't dish it out, she said. I liked her honesty. Why the hell didn't I question it? Was she playing me the whole time? Kira read me well, no doubt about it. I was desperate for support and for confirmation that I wasn't to blame for Ryan's infidelity. I have no proof that Ryan strayed more than once, but Kira made me believe it didn't really matter. Surely once is bad enough, she said. When I dithered, she was quick to come up with the plan. Let's enjoy ourselves in the meantime. And that was it. I gave in. In return for helping me get payback, she was thrilled when I said she could stay at our house and take in the sights of London, free board and lodgings. She'd wind Ryan up and keep me posted. The point at which I should have pulled the plug was when she giggled and wondered aloud if he might dare make a pass at her. If he does, we've got our answer, she said, clapping her hands together. Oh my God, was I really that naive? A sudden shrill pulse pierces the air. It's my phone. It'll be her. Yes, yes, yes. I scrabble around in my pocket to dig out the phone. It's hard to hold. My fingers are so damp. They've turned blue and the fingertips white. I flick and flick at sand grains speckled across the screen. It'll be Kira. I'm so relieved that I let out an enormous puff of air. I shouldn't have worried. It'll have been too difficult for her to speak before. Relief washes over me and I visualise Kira's smiling face. All will be forgiven in a heartbeat. Perhaps I might even forgive Ryan. Who knows? When I finally clear the screen, it shows up number unknown. My own number would show up if the call were from my iPhone. Kira suggested if she borrowed my iPhone, used it in front of Ryan, it would add depth to the ruse. He'll wonder where you are, why I've got your phone. He'll really freak if I don't tell him why. Maybe he'll think you've been kidnapped, had your phone stolen. Come on, you know it makes sense. I can hear her now. Then it hits me. It'll be Ryan calling. Perhaps he got this number by checking recent calls on my iPhone when Kira wasn't looking. But why isn't his number showing up? Maybe he's using another phone, a new burner, so we can play the game of covert calls together. My mind is all over the place. Funny how many thoughts you can have in such a short space. It's to do with heightened senses. Maybe Ryan just wants to ask me to come home. And at this moment, I'd probably agree. I finally press accept and wait for the caller to speak first. Flo, are you there?